OK. So this is a uh, part two of our CE 3303 um, discrete time signals and systems exam two review. Um, I know I said in part one I was going to cover Fourier series for your transform and sampling. I'm going to go ahead and cover this in part two because part one already got pretty long. Um, I'm not going to try to spend too much time on it. Uh, a lot of it's very conceptual and mainly for your understanding of the discrete time for your transform. So I'll try to get through it. Um, but yeah, after Fourier series and Fourier transform and sampling, we'll talk in detail about the discrete time Fourier transform, do a couple of examples, talk about frequency response and how it's used, what it means, um, and of course, a few examples on that. And then lastly, we'll go into the discrete Fourier transform, what that is, how it relates to the DTFT, and how to, of course, calculate it. Um, sadly, I know, I believe y'all, the fast Fourier transform is uh, covered on y'all's exam. Um, that was something I had struggled with. I had planned on reviewing it and being able to teach it for this exam review. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time, so sorry, I won't be able to go over that. Um, but I will be able to cover these, so hopefully that's enough. But let's go ahead and get started. So we'll go talk about, let's talk about the Fourier series and what it is. Okay. So the Fourier series is quite simple. Let's say I have some random function, or I'm sorry, random signal. Okay, I tried my best to show that this signal is periodic. Um, basically, here, I tried my best to show that these repeat. I know it's not perfect, but basically these are the periods. So what the Fourier series says is that any periodic signal, okay, in this case, this random periodic signal, can basically be represented as a sum of cosines and sines. OK, so I'm going to write that. Any periodic signal can be presented as a sum of cosines and sines. OK. And that's what I'm trying to show here. So what I really should say is a sum of weighted cosines and sines. I've been by weighted is the, the amplitude. So clearly all of these have different amplitudes and they have different frequencies. And that's the big thing. Um, so let me actually just go ahead and write out the formula so I can go ahead and explain a few things. So the formula goes X of T and we'll call this X of T where x of t is some periodic signal is equal to a sub zero plus summation from n is equal to one to infinity of a sub n cosine n omega naught t plus b sub n sine of n omega naught t. <clears throat> so we call this the sine cosine representation. OK. So what this basically means. Is that this periodic function X of T is represented by this constant a sub zero. So this a sub zero is the DC offset, if you will. So if I draw an axis right here. OK, so this is. This is the origin, okay? We've got time, we've got x of t here. Uh, as you can see, the DC offset is maybe like right here, one. Okay, so basically it's just like shifting your signal up and down. So for this case, the DC offset would be one, a sub zero. And then we've got something interesting. We've got this summation of these weighted cosines and sines. And the weight being these coefficients a sub n and b sub n. OK. Now, if you notice, we have a fundamental frequency. Omega naught. And omega naught 
is our what I mean by fundamental frequency is it's the frequency that X of T itself is oscillating at the period, right? Um, so what you'll notice is that we are summing from N is equal one to infinity. So what's happening here is we actually have these cosines and sines they're all going to be at integer multiple frequencies of the fundamental frequency. So basically what that means is let's say a sub zero is just this constant. Let's say it's one. OK, and then we're going to sum, say, a cosine at, at this frequency, the fundamental frequency. OK, plus a sine at the same frequency, and let's say they have the same weight. And then n is going to increase to two. And now the frequency is going to double. Let's say the weight is um, double that as well. So now we'll have something like this. Plus. Maybe this is weighted heavier too, and that'll go on basically to infinity. We'll have all these sums. We'll have all these cosines and sines at different amplitudes and different frequencies all adding together to form this periodic function X of T. OK. Um, and so conceptually, all you really need to understand is that when we're talking about the frequency domain, oh, actually, I'll get to that when we get to Fourier transform, but basically any periodic function can be represented as these sums of cosines and sines. And even though this doesn't look like a sign, it's basically a sign of frequency zero. Okay. And so now, if you remember, Euler's formula. We have e to the j theta equal to sine. I'm sorry. It's equal to cosine theta plus j sine theta. So complex exponentials e to the j theta is cosines and sines. So another way of actually writing this Fourier series is through a complex exponential uh, form and that being x of t is equal to sum from n is equal to negative infinity to infinity x sub n e to the j n omega naught t okay and before i get a little more into detail about this uh if we look here these a sub n's and these B sub n's, these are called uh, Fourier coefficients, okay? <laughs> and all that means is that these are the weights of our different sines and cosines at these particular frequencies. So if I say I've got like A sub two is equal to maybe five, okay, that means I know that at two times the fundamental frequency, I've got an amplitude of five for my cosine and for my sine, and those two are being added together, and that'll continue to infinity. Okay. So these are simply called your Fourier coefficients. Now, if we look at this complex exponential form, complex exponential representation. OK, remember. A complex exponential is just another way of writing sines and cosines. It's all you need to worry about for now. So if we look here, this is actually doing the exact same thing as what we saw above. OK, if we just think of this as. Oh, OK. We just think of this as cosine plus j sine theta, <clears throat> we are summing cosines and sines together. And x sub n is simply the weight of that. OK, now I can't fully explain it personally, but we do start at negative infinity to infinity because uh, the way I kind of think about it is just. If you think of a complex exponential, it simply revolves um, around a circle. OK, and if you've got uh, positive frequencies, you are simply going 
counterclockwise. But if you have negative frequencies, so wherever n is negative, because then we'll get a negative frequency in here, we're just going the opposite direction. Uh, negative frequencies themselves don't actually have real world connotations, I would say. Um, but, but they are helpful in the math, as you'll see when we get to DTFT. All you got to do is think about these complex exponentials as another way of representing cosines and sines. So this is still stating that any periodic signal X of T is being represented as a sum of uh, sines and cosines, and this is the weight. Okay, and of course, n times omega naught are the different frequencies of those sines and cosines. Okay. So if I were to graph, this is also called a Fourier coefficient. It is just a different form of it. OK, if I were to graph these Fourier coefficients, OK, so let's say I have. Um, let's say I have a periodic signal. Such as I believe it would be. Yeah. Let's say this is my periodic signal. OK, it's just these rectangles repeating. If I take the four, if I, I calculate the Fourier series of this uh, X of T. OK. I'm, I'm calculating the Fourier coefficients X sub N. And if I graph those, so. And honestly, it might be better to call these K just so you don't confuse it with the the N in the in the time domain for discrete time. So if I've got K, <clears throat> I just start graphing these uh, Fourier coefficients. You don't need to really understand how I got these. I just want to explain that these are all the weights of the different um, cosines and sines, basically. So this is x sub 0, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub negative 1, x sub negative 2. OK, so you can kind of think that at frequency, if this is, uh, you can think of this as frequency omega naught frequency 2 omega naught, frequency 3 omega naught, okay, minus omega naught, minus 2 omega naught. Okay, so we're basically saying um, if, if I'm taking a look at this periodic signal, I know it equates to a sum of cosines and sines. Well, tell me, what are those sums? What are those individual cosines and sines? Well, I can tell you, uh, the sine and cosine that both oscillate at the frequency two times omega naught. Oops. OK, that oscillate at two times omega naught. They have a magnitude of whatever this much is. OK, um, the DC offset would then be this value right here, um, et cetera. And you can see it's symmetric about the axis because we have negative frequencies. Um, so like obviously you don't really think of negative frequencies as being a thing. Um, so you would just have uh, at, at, at let's say two omega naught and negative two omega naught, they would be the same magnitude because um, it doesn't really matter in that sense. This is more of a mathematical thing to have negative frequencies. Um, but that's all Fourier coefficients are, is they're, they're showing you at that integer multiple of our fundamental frequency omega naught. And by the way, if, if this is our period T, okay, <clears throat> then uh, omega naught is simply equal to 2 pi over T, okay? T being our fundamental period. Okay, that's all omega naught is, is the frequency of this X of T. OK, so these sum these cosines 
uh, are these cosines and sines are just oscillating at integer multiples of our fundamental frequency. And then this is showing us the magnitude of those individual cosines and sines that all add up to create this function right here. OK. Um, so to get to Fourier transform. What you'll actually notice is as you increase the period of X of T, so for instance, I'm increasing the period, OK? Um, I know I drew it bad, but you can see that the period has increased. These uh, Fourier coefficients are actually going to be a lot more finely spaced. OK? You'll see that they'll get closer and closer to each other. OK, I hope I drew that well. I guess I can get a few more in there. But basically, these Fourier coefficients become a lot more finely spaced. OK, you start to get more and more of them. As your period increases. Um, and so what what happens if we take the period to well okay before i get to that what happens if we want to represent an aperiodic signal as a fourier series um we wouldn't be able to do that because as said previously fourier series can only represent periodic signals however we can just think of an aperiodic signal so let's say just simply this rectangular um function right here. We can say it as the period is simply approaching infinity. OK, so if we take the period to approach infinity. Well, then we would say we would take a limit. As T approaches infinity. Of the Fourier series, I won't write it out. And if you take a limit as uh, of a series, you get what? You get an integral, right? If you take the uh, the the limit to infinity of a summation, you do get an integral. So what that gets you is right here. I'll explain here this in a bit. X of omega is equal to negative infinity. To infinity x of t e to the minus j omega t dt. And so what just happened is those that discrete signal we had before where we just graphed these discrete coefficients has now expanded into a continuous function. Okay. And so now this, when people tell you, oh, we're in the frequency domain. This is what they mean. We've got this omega in the frequency domain, and we've got x of omega here. Remember, omega is just our angular frequency. And so now this actually tells us the frequency content of our signal. At each of these frequencies, we can see the magnitude at these frequencies. Meaning at each of these individual frequencies, we can understand what the, the cosine and the sine representation is of of the signal what the frequency content of the signal so we can see that like for instance let's say this this uh signal right here just stops kind of at zero oh okay yeah we we can basically see that like, for instance, let's say this is frequency of like pi thirds or something. OK, we can see at pi thirds, we've got this magnitude right here, meaning we know whenever our, our sines and cosines oscillate at pi thirds, we've got, let's say this magnitude is two. We've got an amplitude of two with a frequency of pi thirds. And that goes for every single frequency along this um, graph. OK, it tells us 
all the frequencies that make up our signal. OK, so all the frequencies that go into adding up to create this signal right here. That's what the Fourier transform tells us. The frequency content of a signal. That's all it's saying is that at all of these individual frequencies, this is the magnitude of that cosine and sine, although there is an offset. Um, as in uh, a, a, a proportional constant, so. I shouldn't say it's the exact magnitude because if you use the inverse for your transform, you end up getting uh, one over two pi negative infinity to infinity x of omega e to the j omega t dw. Like I said, this isn't something like the math you have to worry about. I just want you guys to understand the intuition that when you're looking at a Fourier transform, in this case, in the continuous time domain, understand that the x-axis right here is omega. It's telling you the frequency. And at each of these points on this graph is a new frequency. And the y-axis is telling you the magnitude of those complex exponentials, which remember is just another way of representing sines and cosines. It's telling you the magnitude of those complex exponentials at that particular frequency. You take the integral of this, this function right here, okay, meaning you're summing all these little frequencies together. What's basically happening is you're summing all those complex exponentials at those different frequencies together, and that forms this x of t function. Okay, so that's what people mean when they're telling you what's the frequency content of this signal. This is the frequency content of the signal. The Fourier transform is telling you all the frequencies that make up that signal. And, and that's how filters work and stuff. And that's why the Fourier transform is so important. If I want to create, let's say I want to create a filter that only takes into account frequencies up to here, well, then I, I, I would use the Fourier transform to see what uh, frequencies I need to filter out, basically. OK, so the Fourier transform is very important because it shows you all the frequencies that make up um, our signal in the time domain. So hopefully that makes sense. I tried rushing through it a bit to try to condense it into review. Next, let's talk about sampling. This one I won't spend too much time on. Basically, let's say. So I got this signal. The time domain continuous signal. It looks like this, OK? So I take the Fourier transform a bit. So this is T. We'll call this X of T. <clears throat> now this is Omega. It's X of Omega this is the magnitude of it. By the way, um, and I'll talk more about it in DTFT. The Fourier transform is a complex function. OK, so what that means is there's both a magnitude and a phase portion. Of this function, so what I'm graphing here is the magnitude of the Fourier transform. I could graph the phase of it. Um, I won't right now, but you just have to know that that there's two parts to a complex function, right? There's the magnitude portion and there's the phase portion. So let's say I take the Fourier transform of this this weird signal right here. And it gets me a function that looks. Like this basically. OK. And I'm going to call this right here negative B and this B. OK. So a bit of terminology. Um, this whole area right here from negative B to B is called the bandwidth of the signal. OK. If I'm just looking at positive frequencies and not negative frequencies, I just look right here. This is called the one sided. Bandwidth. OK. And another thing is this Fourier transform here is called band. Limited. Meaning there is a highest possible frequency. And a lowest possible frequency that is uh, represented of this signal. So for instance, B right here is. The highest uh, frequency. In our X of T signal. OK. 
So for instance, like the frequency over here is not represented in X of T. This X of T does not contain any frequencies above the frequency B. Okay. <clears throat> so how do I sample? The way you sample is basically by creating a train of impulses. this goes on forever. So I'm basically <clears throat> taking this train of impulses and I'm multiplying it by this X of T signal. And so what's going to do is I'm going to capture this signal only at wherever these impulses occur. OK, so that's how I'm, I'm sampling this signal. So what happens? Zoom out a bit. I get a discrete version of the signal. Uh, I do this? I know it's really hard to see, but it's basically the signal I drew earlier. See. So we sampled the signal. Okay. If we look back on the frequency side of things, if I took the Fourier transform of this train of impulses. Okay. Don't worry too much how I get it. I'm just trying to explain how we get to DTFT. The uh, Fourier transform of these train of impulses is simply another train of impulses. Okay. And if you recall, multiplication in the frequency domain equates to convolution in the time domain and vice versa. So if I'm multiplying in the frequency domain, that means I'm doing convolution. I'm sorry, if I'm multiplying in the time domain, that means I'm doing convolution in the frequency domain. So what that means is I'm basically taking each of these impulses and multiplying it by this signal wherever each of these impulses occur. So what happens is I end up creating a bunch of copies of that Fourier transform. So this is now in discrete time right here because I sampled. I did a Fourier transform. This is actually the discrete time Fourier transform. So the only difference between a regular Fourier transform and a discrete time Fourier transform is that the discrete time Fourier transform periodically repeats. OK, so let's say this is at zero. This is at omega. Um, we'll just call it omega s. This is two omega s. This is minus omega s. What's happening is this is at zero. This is at omega s. This is at minus omega s. So it's periodically repeating. <clears throat> okay. So remember, Fourier transform tells us frequency content the signal ETFT is the same as Fourier transform except that it periodically repeats. OK, now in terms of sampling, There's a couple things that needs to happen. So this pulse of deltas is how we're sampling. How do we determine the frequency of these deltas, meaning how often we're repeating them? 
Well, the way we do that is what's called um, Shannon's sampling theorem. And that is somewhere over here. OK, yeah. So if we call the frequency of our samples right here, FS, we say that the frequency that which we're sampling needs to be greater then two times B, in this case, two B, remember, is the highest um, frequency that is contained within our original signal. Okay, and I'll explain why this is a rule. And that frequency right there at two B, so this is Shannon's sampling theorem. This frequency right at 2B, the minimum frequency, minimum sampling frequency, is called the Nyquist frequency. Okay, so the reason it needs to be greater than 2B is because if you look at this, we, we look for the highest frequency contained within the signal. Remember, DTFT repeats. So I know I drew it bad, but we can assume that this picture I drew here follows Shannon sampling theorem. It has been sampled greater than 2B. If it's not sampled greater than 2B, then what happens is what's called aliasing. What you end up getting is that before the, the sample of this takes place um, at, say, this delta function, and then this delta function comes and samples it to create this right here, this copy. If you don't follow Shannon's sampling theorem, this is going to start sampling before this is finished. So what you end up getting is something like this, where now these frequencies overlap and this is called aliasing. And aliasing is really bad because now that you've got frequencies overlapping, you can't really tell what belongs to what. Whereas if you want to build a filter, you can easily, you know, filter out frequencies like that or something. But now if I want to filter out just these frequencies, now I'm also getting the frequency in here. So it's aliasing. All it means is if you don't follow Shannon's sampling theorem, uh, your your DTFT copies are going to overlap with each other. Okay. Hopefully that cleared up some conceptual stuff. Um, once again, sorry for rushing through it. There's a lot in this test, um, and I know we need to get to some examples, um, but hopefully that cleared some stuff up for people. Now let's go ahead and actually get to the discrete time for your transform. So the discrete time Fourier transform. So it's quite similar to the Fourier transform you just saw. I will give the definition x of e to the j omega. I'll explain all this here in a bit. It's equal to, we call this the DTFT of x of n. We've got the sum as n is equal to negative infinity to infinity x of n e to the minus j omega n. Okay, this is our discrete time Fourier transform. Remember, this is telling us the frequency content of our signal. And the frequency content of our signal, even in discrete time, is the exact same as in continuous time as we saw but simply we just repeat that every two pi, okay? So what you'll notice is, although we are using a discrete time signal in the time domain, if we take the discrete time Fourier transform, we actually get a continuous function out. Okay. So, 
So let's check this out. I'm gonna do just one small example of DTFT. Um, and then we'll go into frequency response because frequency response is gonna be the major way you actually use DTFT for this class. So let's just go ahead and calculate really quickly. Example, calculate the DTFT of the signal three, two, one. All we do is follow this summation. So we'll get X e to the J omega is equal to X of zero e to the minus J omega zero plus X of one e to the minus J omega one plus X of two e to the minus J omega two. So if we calculate that, oh my bad, huh? Oh, okay, scratch that. I didn't realize we were starting at negative one. So remember this bar indicates where our zero term is, right? So we'll actually have X of negative one E to the J omega Right, so we've got negative j omega, but then we've got negative one. So those will just cancel out, right? So we'll just have e to the j omega plus x of zero e to the minus j of omega times zero plus x of one e to the minus j omega times one. Okay, and what that'll give us is three e to the j omega And then anything to the zero power is just one. So we'll get X of zero is two, two plus two. And then lastly, plus E to the minus J omega. So to simplify this, we probably want to put it in a cosine or sine representation. So if you remember, Euler's identity e to the j theta is equal to cosine theta plus j sine theta and the other one e to the minus j theta is equal to cosine theta minus j sine theta. What we can do is go ahead and separate all of these into that. So I'm going to start with two over here, just well, two and then three cosine theta plus three j sine. I'm sorry, not theta. What you'll get is theta is represented by your omega here. Okay, so we've got cosine omega plus 3j sine omega. Then we'll have plus cosine of omega. Now we're doing this term right here. Minus j sine omega. So then we get, we add these together, two plus four cosine omega. And then three sine minus sine. So plus two J sine omega. Okay. And so that is the discrete time Fourier transform of this signal right here. And if I were to basically graph the magnitude of this function, I could see the magnitude of each complex exponential that adds together to create this function. So I would see the frequency content and then I could uh, graph the phase as well. Um, so let's actually go ahead and take a look at frequency response. So frequency response is quite simple. Okay, let's say we have a function 
x of n is equal to a cosine of omega n plus phi. Okay, some kind of sinusoid. Okay. Any kind of sine. This is a general sinusoid, right? We can transform a cosine to sine or a sine to a cosine by doing a phase shift. So this is any kind of sinusoid, any sine or cosine. We put it through a DTLTI system. What we actually get out is A, right? Remember linear properties, so we keep that A. Okay. I'm going to write this here, but I'll explain it here in a bit. We get the magnitude of e to the j omega cosine of omega n plus our original phi plus the phase, or actually let's write it like this, the magnitude of h e to the j omega plus the phase of h e to the j omega. Okay. So what this is saying, let me actually define this now, h of e to the j omega, and I'll go more into detail, but this is called the, the uh, frequency response. Okay, as you can see, it is also a complex function, and I'll talk a bit more about it right now so you can understand what it is. But what I'm trying to say here, up here, is that basically, if, if we put any kind of sinusoid through a DT LTI system, what's going to come out on the other side is that exact same sinusoid. It's going to look the same, except that its amplitude has been modified by the magnitude of this complex function, and its phase has been shifted by the phase of this complex function. Okay, so this complex function will tell us everything we need to know to understand what is going to happen. Uh, to the output signal um, for our DTLTI system. So if I have some sinusoid like this, okay, I put it through a system. What could happen is it could uh, the the phase could shift. So now maybe it looks like this, um, and the maybe the magnitude increased as well. So we still get the same sinusoid looking function out but the magnitude has increased and the phase has shifted okay and that details the 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 phase shift and the magnitude change are all encompassed within this frequency response function okay so now let me go ahead and define what this frequency response is so if you haven't already noticed dtft is actually a special case of the z transform so if you notice here, h of e to the j omega is simply equal to our transfer function, where z is evaluated at e to the j omega, meaning it has a magnitude of 1. Okay. So this h of e to the j omega, the way you find it is simply by finding your transfer function using the method we described in part 1 and plugging all your z's in, uh, plugging e to the j omega into all your z's, okay? And we'll do an example of that. But yeah, basically what's happening is this h of e to the j omega is going to tell you um, what your sinusoid magnitude is changing by and how much it is phase shifting by. Okay, so let's do a quick example. We can do this one right here. Okay, let's say we're given a system y of n is equal to x of n minus x of n minus 2. And the function we're putting through our system is equal to x of n is x of n is equal to cosine pi n over 4. Okay, so let me go through the process of what's happening here. Okay, we're taking this cosine 
pi n over 4. We're putting it through our DTLTI system. And what we're going to get out is the same cosine pi n over 4, except that the magnitude has changed by the magnitude of our frequency response and it has been shifted by the phase of our frequency response. Okay, so you can see how powerful this frequency response function is. It can ease, if we have a sinusoid as our input to a DTLTI system, we can easily find the output simply by calculating whatever this frequency response is. And we know how much our input signal has changed by magnitude and how much the phase has shifted as well. So let's do this example. First thing we need to do is calculate the transfer function, right? So if you guys remember from, uh, let's see, huh? Oh, never mind. So if you remember, uh, the transfer function is simply our um, x coefficients multiplied by z to the negative k over one minus our y coefficients. So if you look at the top, We'll have one right here minus z to the negative two, right? So we're skipping z to the negative one because we go straight to n minus two. And then it would be all over one minus whatever our um, y terms are above zero. Um, remember, this is for k is equal to zero. So we don't include it in this sum. The sum is k is equal to one to n uh, a sub k. A sub k z to the negative k. Okay. Um, because we don't have any y terms on this side, then the denominator remains one. So we've got one minus z squared as our transfer function. Okay. So now, to find our frequency response using the j omega, h equal to j omega, we simply plug in either the j omega into our transfer function. So that gets us one minus e to the minus two j omega. Okay. So now we just want to simplify this. Um, and the goal really is to, you're, whenever you calculate your frequency response, and I'm going to do another example here. You're always going to get a bunch of complex exponentials, e to the j omegas, adding and subtracting and dividing by each other. The goal is to simplify this frequency response into one complex exponential. Because if you simplify it into one complex exponential, that'll tell you the magnitude and the phase of the entire function, basically. I'll show you that right here. So, yeah. And the thing to note is this is our general frequency response, h of e to the j omega. So if I were to graph this, I'm not too sure exactly what it would look like, um, but I'm just going to graph something, okay? So let's say my graph looks something like, like this, okay? Basically what that means, um, and this is h of e to the j omega. Let me actually call this omega for discrete time. This is the magnitude of h of e to the j omega. Basically what this is saying is that at these lower frequencies, um, my magnitude is staying quite good. Let's say this is one, okay? Uh, my, uh, my, my cosine input function is not changing at all. My magnitude is staying the same. But as I begin to increase the frequencies, the magnitude is starting to decrease. So I'm kind of losing my signal. The magnitude of that signal is decreasing. At a certain point, the magnitude becomes negative as the frequencies keep increasing, right? And so forth, okay? That's what this frequency response is telling me. It's telling me what is gonna happen to my signal as the frequency uh, increases. Um, that's the general frequency response. Now for this particular input signal, we can see the frequency is pi fourths, okay? So what we're going to do is input that into our frequency response. So h of e to the j pi fourths, all right? That's equal now to one 
minus e to the minus 2j pi fourths, meaning that's 1 minus e to the minus j um, pi halves. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. So now let's do some simplification. What we want to do is get this function to basically have the form of, uh, yeah, we'll basically want to do this. We'll have the magnitude times E raised to <coughs> J. It can be minus J or negative J, depends on the angle, the phase of H of E to the J omega. This is why we're trying to simplify this right here into one complex exponential, because as soon as we do that, we can tell the magnitude and we can tell the phase. OK, let's do that. The best way I go about doing that is converting to rectangular coordinates, putting all those together to basically form one X plus J Y and then converting that back to polar. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll have if we convert to rectangular. We'll have one minus and then E to the minus J pi halves. Is simply equal to, I believe. Um, positive J or is it negative J? It is negative J. So then we'll have one minus negative J, which is just. One plus J. OK. So now we've easily already gotten this X plus J Y. Where X is one and Y is also one. OK, so now we want to convert this. Into. Um, a complex exponential. So the way we do that. Is our magnitude. Right is equal to X squared plus Y squared all square rooted. So we'll have one plus one square root. So our magnitude is root two. And then our phase is equal to tangent inverse. Of Y over X, so it's just tangent inverse of one. And that gets us root two over two. So then what we get is H of E to the J pi fourths is equal to root two over two E. Oh wait, my bad. Yeah, so I'm sorry. So tangent inverse of one is pi fourths. You get an angle out of inverse. Um, tangent, right? Because uh, at pi fourths, x is equal to root 2 over 2, y is equal to root 2 over 2. So if we divide those together, we get 1. And that's why we get pi fourths. So this is our magnitude and this is our phase, basically. So we'll have root 2 e to the j pi fourths. Okay, That is our frequency response at this particular frequency. OK, so what this is telling us is at this particular frequency, our cosine n pi over four is going to change by root two. OK, so we're going to multiply the cosine by root two. That's how much the magnitude is changing on the output side of the system and the phase is shifting by pi fourths. So what that tells us is now y of n is simply equal to root two times our original function cosine and pi fourths and we're shifting by another pi fourths and that's our answer that's how frequency response works okay let's do one more example uh, let me grab it Let's say we have y of n 
is equal to minus y of m minus 1 plus x of n minus x of m minus 1. Okay, so this is, remember, our system represented by a difference equation. The input signal we're given is x of n is equal to 1 plus cosine pi halves n. Okay, so remember, we're putting 1 plus cosine pi halves n into our system, which is represented by this difference equation, and we want to know what we get out. So I believe on your test, it'll probably ask, like, use the discrete time for your transform to uh, find the output of the system. Um, remember, frequency response is, is the discrete time for your transform. So whenever you have an input signal that is a sinusoid, you know, oh, okay, cool. I got to use the discrete time for your transform to obtain the frequency response um, of the system. Once I have the frequency response, I can easily obtain the output because then I have the magnitude and the phase change of how much that input signal changed by, and that's what my output signal is. And although this one does not look like a sinusoid, you can just think of it as a sinusoid with frequency equal to zero. Okay, and that's how we'll be able to use the frequency response on that constant one. So the first thing we need to do is, of course, find our frequency response. So let's find our transfer function h of z is equal to, let's take our uh, top coefficients, right? 1 minus e to the negative 1 over 1 minus, uh, we take uh, our y, so 1 minus a negative 1, so it becomes plus, and then z to the negative 1. So if we want to get rid of those negative exponents, it's pretty simple, just multiply by z over z. We get z minus 1 over z plus 1. Okay, and so now our trans, or I'm sorry, our frequency response h of e to the j omega is equal to just sub e to the j omega into z, e to the j omega minus 1 over e to the j omega plus 1. Okay, and remember this is our general frequency response. If I graph the magnitude for this, it's telling me how is the magnitude of this 1 plus cosine function changing at each frequency, okay? And so, like I said, if I were to graph it, let's say maybe it looks like this. What we're doing for this problem is our frequency is at pi halves. So we wanna see what we're doing at pi halves. Okay, we're gonna basically take this and that's the magnitude we'll get. And we do wanna see the frequency at, at zero. So we'll see the frequency at zero as well. Remember, this is not, say the frequency response of x of n this system this is the frequency response of this system okay say i had a different system that had a different different equation difference equation if i find the frequency response of that system it's going to be totally different and it could basically change this input signal um, and it can make the output something different than what we're going to see here this frequency response is characteristic of this signal so what this is telling me is what is the system doing to this input equation? OK. So let's figure out what it's doing. So first, let's do the easy one. Let's take. Uh, H of E to the J zero. OK, so that's just going to get us. Remember, we're just plugging zero into an exponent, so we're going to get one. So we get one minus one over one plus one. OK, that's regardless, it's just going to get us zero. So what that tells us is when we put this input signal into our function, I mean into our system, this constant term one is going to go away. OK, because what's happening is if we just have zero, that means we've got a magnitude of zero. We've got a phase of zero. So we're multiplying that one by zero and it's going to go away on the output side. That's how that changed. Now we need to figure out what's happening at frequency pi halves, so e to the j pi halves. So we'll get e to the j pi halves minus 1 over e to the j pi halves plus 1. So let's go ahead and try to simplify this. We end up getting, let's see.
Okay, so yeah, the best way to simplify this is going to be. How did I do this? Right, okay. So. We're going to have to recall this. Cosine theta. Is equal e is equal to e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta divided by two. Sine theta is equal to e to the j theta plus e, I'm sorry, minus e to the minus j theta over 2j. Okay, so what I'm going to want to do is actually multiply e to the, uh, how am I going to do this again? Oh, I believe I, yeah, I had solved this a different way at first. Oh, wait a minute. I think I made a mistake somewhere. Um, so we had e to the j omega. Um, Plugged our pi has in, which is good. Okay, let's see. Okay, so one thing we could do is I believe, yeah, okay. Let's let's try the way I had originally said. Let's just try to put rectangular coordinates. So e to the j pi halves is simply j. So j minus one over j plus one. So if you remember the way we actually do j minus one over j plus one is I believe we, uh, Multiply by the conjugate, so how that works. Let's see. Yes, so we go ahead and do if we're doing J minus one over J plus one. Then we go ahead and multiply by j minus one over j minus one. So we're doing the conjugate of this one. So what we end up getting is j times j is negative one. Right, j my, times negative one is minus j. And then we get another minus j. Right, so we got j, j squared is negative one, and then a minus j and a minus j, and then a positive one. Okay, we come down here, j squared is negative one. We get a minus j plus j, those cancel out. Then we get a, another negative one. So we end up getting, these cancel out, we get a minus two j over negative two. So then we get positive j. Or negative, yeah. Which is not the right answer. Hold up. I'll be back. I need to figure out what this right answer is. I'm not too sure what I'm doing wrong.
Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is correct. Okay, no, no, this is correct. This is correct. Okay, so we end up getting J. Okay, sorry for the confusion. But yes, we do end up getting J. Okay, so what J is, is, and these are identities you, you need to remember, but J is the same thing as E to the J pi halves. Okay. So now what this is telling us is, remember, we said this uh, because at the zeroth frequency, which is where one is coming in at, uh, we got zero for our frequency response, meaning that one is gone now. At the pi halves frequency, what we end up getting is e to the j pi halves, meaning our magnitude e to the j pi halves is equal to one, and our phase of h of e to the j pi halves is equal to pi halves. Right? This is our phase. That's a one. That's our magnitude. Base. So what that means is y of n is now equal to oops, the magnitude did not change because we just have one. So you got cosine pi halves n and the phase shifted by another pi halves. So that is the output of our system using frequency response. Okay. I think okay yeah I'm gonna go ahead and end this recording here and I will release a part three for DFT because it's a fairly long fairly long topic and not really long just more so tedious uh, if i look at it or you know what no let's just get it real quick okay so let's look at discrete fourier transform now okay so the main motivation behind discrete fourier transform is if you noticed If you noticed the discrete time Fourier transform, although we're taking the discrete time Fourier transform of a discrete signal, the DTFT itself is not a discrete signal. It is a continuous signal, right? It is X of E to the J omega. It is of continuous omega. Okay. So for instance, if we had a Okay, if we had a sine sync discrete function, this is x of n. Okay, we take the DTFT of it. We end up getting this block, basically. This is omega. This is the magnitude of our DTFT. Okay, so as you can see, it's a continuous signal. It's not a discrete signal. The goal of all types of discrete uh, basically digital signal processing is we're trying to get these signals into a computer. That's why we talked about discrete time because, you know, computers take discrete time signals. Well, they take digital signals. So the first step to getting to digital is discrete. Thing is, if we want to put a frequency representation of our discrete signal to a computer, we can't put the DTFT in there because, well, it's a continuous time signal. We need to find a way to actually make it a, um, a, uh, a discrete signal, right? So that's where discrete Fourier transform comes in. And I'll be the first to say that, like, the naming convention is horrible. <laughs> the difference between DTFT and DFT um, is a fairly easy one, but with that naming convention, you wouldn't really know. So let's say I have this sign sync function. 
Okay, and this represents my discrete time Fourier transform. Oops. Okay, this is my frequency representation of x of t. Okay, uh, I'm I'm using a different x of t. Don't worry about the previous drawing I did. But this is my DTFT, okay? What I want to do is make this DTFT into a discrete signal. So the way I do that is I simply sample it. So this is now DFT. The main thing you just got to realize about DFT is that it's simply a sample version of the DTFT. OK. And so if I write this, I'm going to write the formula for this and I'll explain it. X of K is our DTFT. It's equal to N is equal to zero to M minus one. X of N to the minus JK omega naught N. And so the way we're actually sampling is oh, this is omega naught, this is two omega naught, this is three omega naught, vice versa. Okay, that's why we have this. So oh, I wrote uh, that kind of, I wrote lowercase omega, I meant to write uppercase, but don't get the point. Um, but basically, DFT is just sampling our DTFT at these integer multiples of omega naught. OK. And this N right here. I'll call it also N naught, but it's the same thing. This N is going to be. Uh, where'd you go? Yes, so N is actually, um, here you go. Actually, let's not write it like that. Let's say omega naught is two pi over N naught. So N naught is actually our fundamental period. Yeah, it's the period length basically. Um, and you'll see in an example what it means a lot easier right now. Let's see. OK, yeah, so this is the discrete Fourier transform. Literally just think about it as yes, yeah, sampling the DTFT. OK, I'll do an example real quick and that should hopefully clear some things up. Let's go ahead and do this one. Say we have um, x of n is equal to one, two, three, four. Okay. Let's find the DFT of this. So what we're gonna do. Yes. Okay. So the DFT basically takes, let's say we have we have this aperiodic signal, right? We got one, two, three, four. What the DFT is doing is it's actually taking this aperiodic signal and it's actually making it periodic. So that repeats. So we come back over here as well. And that repeats. And so this, our period and not our period length is actually the length of our aperiodic signal. Because if you look, we have four and then we repeat again. And so the period length is four. Okay. 
That's what we're doing there. Let me get rid of this. So once we have our end knot, we have our upper limit for our DTF, our DFT, and now we need to find our omega knot, so our sampling frequency. So omega knot is simply equal to two pi over four, which is equal to pi halves. Okay. So now what we're going to say is x of k is equal to n is equal to zero to three for minus one. Okay. X of n e to the minus j k pi halves are omega naught times n. Okay. So this is how we're going to find our DFT. So now I'm going to find x of zero. I'm using k. Okay. So the zero is k is equal to zero. So that's equal to x of zero. So n right now is zero. X of zero is one. Right. If I put zero into this co into this exponent, I'm going to get one out anyways. So I just leave it as one. Okay. Plus x of one, which is two. But remember, k is zero right now. So I'm always going to have zero in this exponent for this first case equals zero term. So what you'll notice is that every time you use k is equal to zero, that first um, term of your DFT, you're basically just going to write out your coefficients from x of n. Okay, because we're always going to be putting zero into k into this exponent. So this whole exponent is just going to be equal to one anyways. So we'll just be left with our coefficients. So with this, we end up getting 10. So now let's do x of 1. Now this one, this stays the same one because we're still putting n is equal to 0 in there. But now we're getting 2 e to the minus j k is 1 right now. Pi halves n is 1. Plus 3 e to the minus j k is still 1. Pi halves n is now 2. Plus 4 e to the minus j k is 1. Pi halves n is 3. Okay, so now with what we get there, we'll have 1 plus 2 e to the minus j pi halves, okay, plus 3 e to the, these 2's cancel out, so minus j pi okay, plus 4 e to the minus j 3 pi over 2. Remember I said working with complex numbers is very important. Um, so you have to be able to recognize what these are. So I'll have one. Uh, remember e to the minus j pi halves is going to be negative j. So minus 2j. OK. e to the minus j pi, whether or not it's minus j pi or positive j pi, um, if you have pi just in the exponent, you're going to get one out. So this becomes plus three. And now e to the minus j three pi halves. So negative three pi halves is the same thing as positive pi halves. So we're going to get positive j out of that. So we get plus four j. OK, so what we get from there is now four. Minus two j. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I said you'll get positive one out. No, no, no. Uh, you should get negative one out. If you have negative pi or pi, you will get a negative out. So it's minus three. If you have zero in there, you're, you're going to get one out. So then we should have negative two minus two J. OK, so that's our X of one term. Now let's do X of two. And we'll get one plus two E to the minus j my formatting so, so e to the minus j pi halves k is two now n is one plus three e to the minus j pi halves k is two n is two plus four e to the minus j pi halves k is two n is three 
Okay, so let's calculate this out. We get one plus these twos cancel. We've got one plus two e to the minus j pi plus three e. This two cancels, but then we get e to the minus j two pi plus four. These two cancels e to the minus j three pi. So let's look at this. We get one, then we got pi, so we get negative two. Right? Then we look over here, we've got minus two pi. Minus two pi is the same thing as two pi, and two pi is the same thing as zero. So e to the zeroth is just one, so we get plus three. And then we look here, minus three pi. Minus three pi is the same thing as minus pi. So we'll get a negative one, so we get minus four. So this will equate now to uh, four minus six, which will get us negative two. Now finally, let's do x of three. Oops. X of three will get us one plus two e to the minus j pi halves. K is three, x is one, I mean n is one plus three e to the minus j pi halves. Um, k is three, n is one. Lastly, plus four e to the minus j pi halves. K is three, I'm sorry, k is two. I mean, n is two. And n is three over here. So now we get one plus two e to the minus j three pi over two plus 3e minus j, these twos cancel out. So 3 pi plus 4e to the minus j, 9 pi over 2. Okay, let's calculate this out, 1. Okay, and remember, minus 3 pi over 2 is the same thing as positive pi over 2, so we'll get plus 2j. And then 3 pi is the same thing as pi, so we'll get minus 3. And then lastly, 9 pi over 2 is a, it's a bit tricky, but it is actually the same thing as, I believe, um, negative pi over 2 is what it should be. Yes, because I think what we end up getting is, um, let's do 3 pi over 2. We do like. Yeah, I think if we do 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi, then we end up getting, uh... oh yeah, so this is 2 times around, so it'd be plus 4 pi. So we get um, 3 pi over 2, oh no, 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 that's not right. So what exactly is 9 pi over 2? 9 pi over 2, it looks like we get negative pi halves, yeah, so minus 4j. Okay, so then we get 1 minus 3 is negative 2, and then 2 minus 4 is uh, negative 2j. And finally, that completes the DT, DFT. So x of k is equal to 10, and then minus 2 minus 2j. Oh wait, I'm sorry, this should be plus 2j. Yeah. Minus 2 plus 2j, negative 2, and then minus 2 minus 2j. And that right there is your DFT. It's a very tedious thing, so I really suggest um, practicing, really, really practicing this. Unfortunately, it's getting very late and I think we've gone over time. Um, so I don't think I can cover DFT convolution right now. Um, if you do need help in DFT convolution, it's, it's a fairly simple thing. I can kind of explain the steps right now, but I will be available on Monday from 2.30 to 4. 
Um, but basically, it's simply uh, you have to zero pad. So if you remember, if you remember from convolution, if you multiply, if you convolute x of n or it's x one of n, convolve with x two of n, and you get y of n out. Okay. Uh, yeah, the length of x1 of n is say n1, and the length of x2 of n is say n2, and the length of this is say nc. nc is equal to n1 plus n2 minus 1. Okay, hope you remember that from convolution. So for instance, if I had 1, 2, 3, and I had 3, 2, 4, 1, Okay, this is x1 of n, this is x2 of n. If I convolve these two, that means the length of y of n and c is going to be 3 plus 4 minus 1, which is equal to 6. Okay, so the reason that's important with uh, d of t is we need to do something called zero padding. So let's say not going to go through this full example, but let's say we're given x of n is equal to 1, 2, 3. Okay. Now let's say we have a DTLTI system that is x of n plus x of n minus 1. Okay, and it asks use d of t to find y of n. What we're going to do is first we need to find uh, we need to convolve something. So remember, x of n convolved with our impulse response is equal to y of n. The first thing we need to do is recognize that if y'all remember the moving average form where we just have um, x terms on one side for a difference equation, you just read off the coefficients for your impulse response. So h of n is simply equal to 1, 1. OK. And so if you look here, the n1, OK, our length of x of n is equal to 3, and our length of h of n is equal to 2. So that means the length of y of n is going to be 3 plus 2 minus 1, which is equal to 4. OK. So now the reason this is important is now what we actually need to do is called zero padding. So I'm going to call this now x prime of n instead of x of n. And I need to basically make x prime of n length 4. So what I do is 1, 2, 3, and then I zero pad it to make it a length 4. I do the same thing for my impulse response, h prime of n. Get one, one, zero, zero. Okay. So the next steps is although DFT is a sampled version of DTFT, it is still technically in the frequency domain, just in a sampled version of the frequency domain. So the same thing applies where we have um, convolution in the time domain is the same thing as convolution in the frequency domain. So what I mean by that is if we have x of n and we convolve it with h of n, we'll get y of n. Well, if we take dft x of k and multiply it by dft h of k, we should get y of k. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the dt dft here, so we'll get x of a. We'll take the dft here, we'll get h of k. And then we will multiply the two to get y of k. Okay. And then we'll use inverse DFT to find Y of N, which I realize now I haven't shown y'all inverse DFT, but it's very simple. It's X of N is equal to one over N naught. Sum of K is equal to zero to N naught minus one. X of K e to the J K omega naught N. 
So the main thing to realize is that on inverse DFT, okay, our exponent is now positive, it's not negative, and we have this uh, proportional factor one over n naught. Okay, so you have to remember that one over n naught. And it, basically, this is just going to follow the same formulation that we did for uh, when doing DFT, going that way, where we we you know we had x of k, and we did our summation. We had like one plus, and then we had uh, you know complex exponential, blah blah blah, and then we simplified it. This is going to be the same process. So we would simply have let's say, I guess we can do an example really quickly. Um, But I'm going to go ahead and say, since we should already know how to do DFT from the example above, just follow these steps, you know, zero pad, OK? And then take the DFT, x of k, h of k, multiply them together to get y of k. So I'm already going to start with that y of k. Let's say y of k is equal to let's go. Yeah, this one. 54 minus 18 plus 2j minus 2, then negative 18 minus 2j. OK, this is my y of k. So the way I obtained y of k is I zero padded x of n. I took the dft of it. I zero padded h of n. I took the dft of that, and I multiplied those two dfts together. Meaning, let's say x prime of k was 9, 4, minus 5j, minus 1, and then 4 plus 5j, and then h prime of k was 6, minus 2, minus 2j, 2, minus 2, plus 2j. OK, so multiplying these out, I would get y of k. So I would multiply 9 times 6, 4 minus 5j times minus 2 minus 2j. You'd have to FOIL for that, minus 1 times 2. And then 4 plus 5j plus minus 2 plus 2j, you'd have to FOIL for that as well. But what you should get is this right here. OK, so if you want, you can check yourself. Basically, the example I'm using is um, x of n is equal to 4, 5, and h of n is equal to 1, 2, 3. So this is a different example from what I was showing above. Um, so I will actually do that. But basically, I, I'm skipping the steps to get to y of k. But if you want to figure it out yourself to do some practice, this is your formulation, basically. Your input signal is 4, 5. Your h of n is 1, 2, 3. OK, if you do DFT properly, remember, don't forget a 0 pad. OK, so this should be 4, 5, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0. If you do your DFT correctly, your x of k should be like this, and your h of k should be like this. You multiply them together, and you get y of k. So now let me show you how to do um, inverse DFT. So it's the same thing if we got y of 0, and now we're using n, not k. OK, so this is referring to n. We get 1 over 4, OK, because our n naught is equal to 4. It's, it's the length of this, OK? All times 54. And remember, I'm putting n equals 0 into this exponent. So I don't have to worry about the complex exponential right now. It's all going to equate to 1, so I'm just going to put the coefficients. So we got 54 minus 18 plus 2j minus 2 minus 18 minus 2j is equal to that. OK. Um, so if you do the algebra, you should get 4. OK, I'm going to skip some algebra steps. I'll have the answers here. That way you can check it yourself. Um, but if I do all the algebra steps, it's going to take way too long. So if I do y of 1, I get 1 fourth. I will get 54 plus my coefficient minus 18 plus 2j. That's the whole coefficient. 
okay, e to the j pi halves. Okay. The reason I'm using pi halves is I calculated my n naught to be four, right? That n naught is going to be the length of your of your y. Remember, n one plus n two minus one. And so omega naught is equal to two pi over four, which is equal to pi halves, right? That's where this pi house comes from. And I'm sorry, it should not be minus. We're doing inverse DFT. So notice I'm not using minus. That's the difference. We got e to the j pi halves. OK. And then k, we'll do n is 1, k is 1. OK, minus 2, e to the j pi halves n is 1, k is 2, plus minus at minus 2j, e to the j pi halves, n is 1, k is 3. Okay. Do all the algebra, and what you should get is 13. Let's do y of 2. You know, 1 fourth times everything. We got 54 plus minus 18 plus 2j. e to the j pi halves. See how this is basically the same thing as DFT, except the difference is it's a positive exponent, and um, uh, k and n have basically been flipped. So throughout this whole summation, k is changing and n is staying constant, whereas in the regular DFT, forward DFT is what it's called, um, k is staying constant and n is changing. So here, n is 2, k is 1, OK? Oops. And then minus 2, e to the j pi halves, pi halves, OK? n is 2, k is 2 plus minus 18 minus 2j e to the j pi halves n is 2 k is not 3 do all the algebra for that and you should get 22. in the last term y of 3 we get 1 fourth times 54 plus minus 18 plus 2j is the j pi halves times um, n is one, uh, 3, k is 1, minus 2, e to the j pi halves, n is 3, k is 2, plus minus 18, minus 2j, e to the j pi halves, n is 3, k is 3. Okay, do all the algebra correctly, you should get 15. So our y of n, the output to our system, is equal to 4, 13, 22. That's how you do that. So I'm going to go over this stuff really quickly because I know I did rush through it. But basically, I mean, I'll show it kind of how you'll get it on the test, I imagine. So it'll probably say something like, we have a discrete uh, a DTLTI system represented by x of n. I mean, y of n is equal to um, x of n plus 2 x of n minus 1 plus 3 x of n minus 3. And our input signal x of n is equal to 4, 5. And so what you have to be able to recognize is remember that when you have a difference equation that only has x terms in it, your impulse response h of n is simply the coefficients of, of each of these, right? So h of n is simply equal to 1, 2, 3, right? And so then you see that the length of x of n is 2, the length of h of n is 3, I subtract 1, and I get 4. So that's going to be my n naught, my length of y of n. OK. So then I need to zero pad everything. So x prime of n is going to become 
four five zero zero. My H prime of N is going to become one two three zero. OK, he's zero pad to match the length that Y of N is going to Y of K is going to be. Oh, I'm sorry. This, no, no, this is X prime of N. OK, so now when you do DFT, all your lengths match up N naught is equal to four. That means for every DFT you're doing for X of K and H of K, your omega naught is equal to two pi over four, which is equal to pi halves. So you're staying consistent with everything. So you do the DFT with omega naught being pi halves and N naught being four. OK, you do the DFTs of these two things and you should get these up here. OK. Once you get those two up there, you multiply them together to get y of k. Because remember, we're doing con convolution x of n convolved with h of n. So then we would do multiplication in the frequency domain x of k times h of k. That gives us y of k. And then we do our inverse DFT just like we did right now of y of k. And that'll get us our y of n. Okay. So hopefully that helps. Sorry, I couldn't cover fast Fourier transform. Um, sorry if this was a little rushed and not as good as the first review. There's so much more material on this exam than the first exam, but hopefully this helps. I will be in, um, I will be available for help tomorrow, Monday um, from 2.30 to 4 um, if you need any extra additional help. Um, but for now, hopefully um, this is good. Thank you guys.